start today with a little um, quote. And, and so pay close attention to the words and see if you recognize it. Propel, propel, propel your craft softly down liquid solution. Ecstatically, 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 ecstatically. Existence is simply illusion. Yeah, I was going to ask, do you recognize the simple idea behind these lofty words? Do you, do you know who said them? I think some of you have figured out that it's a song. So you're right, it's row, row, row your boat. Let's all sing it. Okay, and, and oh, you want to play it for us? And let's just row, row, row your boat. in our life, 
what, a serious illness, a, a breaking of a relationship, the death of a loved one. We are thrown to the ground in despair. We are blind and hurting. We're unable to go on as we have before. And we hear God speaking. going to read a little bit more, the rest of the story, what happened next to Saul. There was a disciple, a follower of the way, a, fo a follower of Jesus Christ, in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying. He has seen in a vision that a man named Ananias will come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So here we kind of have it from, coming from the, the other side. All we know is that Saul is... He's been in this house, he's been praying for three days, he can't see anything. He's had this profound experience, but he doesn't quite yet know what it means or what he's to do with it. Well, guess what? Ananias is terribly afraid. He said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to, to bind all those who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I will sh myself will, will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Can you imagine how Ananias must be feeling? He went. I think he went with fear and trembling because he was obedient to God. He entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up, and he was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So for several days, then Saul was with the disciples in Damascus. And then immediately he began to, to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. What a dramatic transformation. What a change. I love that we have the story of Ananias, that we know his name. And it really helps us to think about when God tells us to do something and we obey, God will answer those prayers. I say, you know, we're not told that he went with fear and trembling. We're not told that he went with boldness. All we're told is that he went. He was an instrument of healing for Saul. And then Saul was an instrument. This highly educated man, this guy with all these talents and gifts, and God changed him and used him to proclaim the name of Jesus. Paul now believed that God loved the world so much that he sent his only son Jesus to teach and to preach and to heal people and to show us the way to live and to love. And he definitely used his dramatic experience of God to illustrate his preaching. And yet, Paul knew to keep it simple. That's why I had Suzanne read the passage that she did. He knew to keep it simple. Paul had all these talents, and he used his talents. He used to use them against Christians, against Christ's disciples. And now he used them in order to tell people about how God had acted in Jesus Christ. See, he used his travel connections. He used his education. He used his knowledge of different languages, his persuasive speech. They were all fueled now 
and by the power of the Holy Spirit to tell people about Jesus. And he deliberately used simple words that pointed the way to Christ rather than complicated speech and excess verbiage. There's a version of the Bible called the, the Message. And I, I like this because it's written in contemporary English. It really um, get, talks the way we talk. So I'm going to read just a, a small quote from that. This is Paul, again, talking to the people in Corinth. And he says, I've become just about every kind of servant there is. In my attempt to lead those, I must into a God-saved life. Friends, that's making disciples. A God-saved life. Paul says, I did all this because of the message. I didn't want to just talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. Are you excited? Are you getting excited? Thinking about, I've, I've asked you several times a day, how do you see God in the world? How do you see God's love? How have you experienced God? You know what? We can all do this because every one of us has had a profound experience of God, a way that God makes God known in our lives. So we can tell our story in our own words without making it too complicated, without making it too long or, or using too many words. Right, for, for, for instance, for Paul, it was, it's on the road to Damascus, there was a blinding light, God was speaking. That's pretty simple. Now, you know, there's a lot of letters from Paul in here. So he does use words to explain things. But that's his story. I was on the road. God blinded me. God talked and I listened and it changed me. Can you boil your story down to a short sentence or two? How do you know that God loves you? When has God picked you up, you were on one path, and turned you around and, and set your feet on the path that made a difference in your life, that transformed you? I know, as I said earlier, it often comes in times of crisis. So our stories of God, our stories of God's transformation, is often set in this bigger story. For me, and I, I will tell you just briefly, it, um, it happened when my daughter had, was in the hospital with a brain tumor. And I've told uh, parts of the story at other times. There are many other times when God has talked to me, but that was a really dramatic time. And I could say, I was in a hallway in the hospital, I heard God speaking, and it changed my life. It was just that simple. I could, I could use more words, but it's just that simple. I challenge you this week to, to tell your story to somebody. To tell your story. And maybe you tell the big story. Or maybe you tell the simple couple of sentence story. But tell it to somebody. You know, when we experience God in, those, in a big way, we need to mark those moments. That they're turning points in our lives. And for me, there are moments when I was age 12 and age 15 and age 20, 23. I listed them all out here. 20, 28, 31, 35. I, I could keep going and you would know how old I am. There are all the points in my spiritual journey. And I can tell stories about each one of those profound experiences. The, the one at 31 was the, the big one that I just told you with my daughter. But I... But I also believe that we need to be aware of God's presence in our ordinary, everyday lives. We need to tune in and to recognize how God works each and every day and night in our world. So I'm going to give you a little um, Methodist teaching now. John, many of you know John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement. And uh, we are a Methodist church. And um, when I study what John preached and taught, it really helps. And so I'm going to share a little bit of that today. 
So how do we recognize God's presence? With spiritual disciplines. The spiritual disciplines help us to become more aware of God. They help us to exercise our faith. Just like when we exercise our bodies, our bodies get stronger. As we grow in faith, we grow in loving God and loving our neighbor. You know, if we want to be the best that we can be at anything, we got to work at it. Musicians know this. Athletes know this. we got to practice. Um, and many of you have heard me play the flute now, and I'm, I'm uh, reminded of that daily practice. I've been taking lessons for almost two years before I got brave enough to play in church, so I've taken a lot of practice. But I'm reminded of the story of a woman who broke her hand, and she went to the doctor to have it taken care of. And as her hand healed, the woman, of course, was asking, you know, about her activities. When would she be able to resume her daily activities? And the doctor assured her that her, her hand was healing and soon she'd be able to wash the dishes and write letters and, and uh, get on the computer and whatever else she needed to do. And she said, will I be able to play the piano? And the doctor said, yeah, of course, you, you'll, you'll be able to play the piano. She said, oh, that's great. I never could before. <laughs> now without practicing. <laughs> so think of that. Well, with spiritual disciplines help us practice our faith. And they include acts of piety and acts of mercy. So acts of piety are the public worship of God. Here we are, worshiping God. The ministry of the word, um, the Lord's Supper, family and private prayer, studying the Bible, studying scripture, and fasting or abstinence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk more about that as the season of Lent comes. I talk a lot about fasting then. Um, so then through these partic this participation in acts of piety, we come to love God more. We are inevitably drawn to acts of mercy to doing good to our neighbors. So John Wesley, he urged his followers to do good to all people as fully and as completely as we can. So these acts of mercy or doing good included feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick in prison, uh, caring for those who are ill, educating the illiterate. And there are stories in, in John Wesley's life of how he did those things. Um, it, before he started talking about that, that people didn't do a whole lot of that. Um, but he made it an intentional discipline, and so we've continued that. Um, if you continue to read in the book of Acts or 1 Corinthians, both of those scriptures we read from today, um, you'll see how Paul is growing. We got the transformation story today. But I encourage you to read more in the book of Acts and just see how he grew. You know, uh, he was this, the, the same person, that educated person, but then God transformed him and he was able to use his education, his gift for languages, his gift for relating to people and teaching to help them to understand about Jesus. So he grew. We can also continue to grow. Many of us have had a lot of years of experience of, of reading the Bible or doing uh, different things in ministries in our lives. And we may not do the same things we did 15 years ago, but we can all do something. And we're, we are, we're growing every day. John Wesley described this growing spiritually as God's sanctifying grace. So there, there's a big word for you, sanctification. But what it really means is that God accepts us as we are, but he doesn't leave us where we are. He accepts us as we are, but he doesn't leave us where we are. See, about the time that we think we have our lives all worked out and we take another step in faith, and um, before we have even a chance to get comfortable with that, the, let alone complacent, God says, that's good. What you're doing. Now, there's this other thing that I've been meaning to talk to you about. God expects us to grow in our walk with God. And, and again, when I mark those points in my life, those, those uh, profound turning points, 
I started to see, hey, they came about every three years. And I thought, wow, I could almost hear God saying, hey, that's good. Now here's this other thing. Maybe you want to chart that out in your own life. Maybe when you're thinking about how to tell your story, you just take a piece of paper and draw a line across it, and then mark that and the line is your life from birth to where you are right now. And then just mark certain things that happen to you along that line, where you experience God. And you might start to see a pattern. For me, it worked out to be like every three years and, and take another profound step. See, this process of sanctification continues to work in our lives. And uh, John Wesley called this going on to perfection, meaning wholeness. Doesn't mean that we never make any mistakes. It means wholeness, being the complete person that, that God created us to be, making us holy. I want to say again, God accepts us where we are, but he doesn't leave us there. And we are called to, to tell our story of how God, through Jesus Christ, acts in our lives. Maybe it's how God carries you through times of crisis. Or maybe it's how God sustains you in daily living. And God becomes increasingly present to us as we practice those spiritual disciplines. So we are called to Christian perfection, to journey into spiritual wholeness through the grace of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. Amen.